Uh, we are so honored today to have the whole uh, leadership team from Winchester College um, speaking to us on the latest trends of independent school education in the UK. We have today here Dr. Tim Hans, the headmaster. Hi, Dr. Hans. Hello. And, hi. And Mr. Um, Nick Wilkes, our second master. Hello. Hi. And Mr. Tom Quayle, who is the head of sixth form progression. Um, Hi, Mr. Quill. And of course, Mr. Andy Shedden, um, the, the Registrar, Head of Admissions at Winchester Hello, College. Everybody. So thank you for all your time. Um, today we'll have uh, 30 to 45 minutes of, our, of your time um, sharing your insights into both the general education trends and also any um, updates from Winchester College uh, vision and um, ongoing uh, innovation in curriculum development of their programs. And lastly, we'll come back to Andy to talk about admissions and what, student, what, what parents and students should do to prepare for a top school such as Winchester College. So we'll start with Dr. Hans. Dr. Hans, we know that Winchester has recently announced some changes. Yep. What are these changes and how do you think they will benefit the pupils? Well, we've taken a really good look at ourselves uh, in this period of lockdown. And one of the quotations I most like about Winchester was made by someone who came here in the 19th century and said, at Winchester, everything is antique, but nothing is antiquated. And we are a wonderful historic school, but we also want to be up to date with everything. So this look at ourselves has involved um, what we teach, and who we teach it to. So to see uh, who we teach it to, we've decided that we want to break down barriers. We will be open to day pupils as we were until 2008, uh, and they can be both boys and girls, but they will only come into the sixth form because we see the sixth form as something that prepares you for university life as a halfway stage. And in terms of what we teach, we want to keep our traditional emphasis on scholarship and service, which we've had, but we also want to make sure that new qualities uh, are taught, not least through our DIV program, and those would be uh, curiosity, um, criticality, and creativity. I'll quote what one of our very wise governors said at a meeting. He said, I want Winchester to ensure that it continues not only to produce literati, but also to produce digerati also. So we've had a, a, a look at ourselves, made sure we value the antique and that we remove anything like our IT network, which was antiquated. I hope that's a reasonable answer. So what kind of new programs are being introduced um, into Winchester and any changes to the infrastructure, the hardware? Yep. 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 So, so we were founded in 1382 uh, by William of Wickham. Uh, we're very grateful to him for his uh, substantial uh, uh, foundation, but we didn't like his IT network uh, quite as much as, as uh, he hoped we would. And so a huge amount of time has gone into digital technology uh, and into training staff in digital uh, learning. As you know, um, part of the, uh, the, the attempt to broaden has been the decision that we will take day pupils. We stopped doing that in about 2008. We used to have about 50 day pupils at any one time. And, and we've thought we should start that up again, only in the sixth form. And we've also thought that we should accept girls in the sixth form, as you mentioned, because we see that as a good transition to university and to later life. But there are no plans to introduce day pupils or, or girl pupils at, at any other stage in the school. Right. So um, beyond COVID being a you know a macro challenge for everyone, um, for the UK in particular, there's also been Brexit. It's now through and dusted and definitely happening. <laughs> Um, how do you think Brexit might have impacted or will impact tertiary education and in turn um, secondary education, in particular independent schools? I think for tertiary education, it would be best to ask some of the universities that are, that are um, participating in, in your series of webinars. Um, in, to be truthful with you, in terms of UK education and this school in particular, I don't really see an effect of Brexit. We, you know, Brexit is to a certain extent insular 
And the whole the whole basis of this place is that we want to be global. So I I mean I'd be interested in what um, Nick and Tom and Andy say, but I don't feel there's been any impact of of, of Brexit on us at all. Either nod or shake your heads, gents. No, I would agree with that, Dr. Hans. Um, we remain fully inter- international and European, and it's great. Yeah, and and proud of it, and we think that's part of an education. Um, no, no question. Great. Well, Dr. Hans, we'll come back to you uh, with a few final questions to wrap up the webinar later. But for now, I'll move on to um, Mr. Quayle um, on some questions uh, that are very uh, important to parents regarding the um, progression beyond uh, Winchester College. So ultimately, um, you know, independent school is a stepping stone into universities and life and beyond. Um, Parents are asking the question because we are reading news in Hong Kong saying that certain universities, in particular Oxbridge, have been prioritizing or increasing the intake um, from less represented um, state schools in the UK. Does that have any impact on independent school students' success in getting into these top institutions? And um, whether there is or not, um, what is Winchester doing uh, or what do you have in place to support students to apply for these top universities in the UK? That's a great question. I think it's a complex landscape, so I don't think there's a simple answer. I think the, the short answer is that, yes, independent schools in the UK have seen an impact. We are still amongst the most competitive schools globally in terms of the destinations that we send our, our leavers to, I think, and I think that will remain true. Um, let me maybe I could just unpack uh, unpack the question a little bit. I think um, we still expect to send a good, very good number of boys to Oxford and Cambridge. I think there are two things that have really changed. I think one is the interests of the the pupils that we take, and Tim and everyone has stressed the, our kind of global outlook. I think our pupils are more willing and more comfortable, maybe, to look globally, so to look at the best US universities, to look at the best universities in Europe, to think about where in the world they want to end up and where they want to study. And generally, they have the kind of um, mobility, confidence, cosmopolitanism to do so. I think the other thing I'd say is if you look at UK courses over the last 20 years, let's say, the the, the rise of specialist universities has really, has, has really taken place. So an economics course at LSE is probably as competitive as, as an economics course at, at Cambridge. Uh, an engineering course at Imperial is probably as, as competitive and, and as good. Um, so I think you've seen that, that people are more willing to look at the course as well as the kind of, um, you know, the name on the sticker. I think that's, that's those, those are kind of two trends within that. Um, I mean, as I was looking back through our, our recent results, I did, it did please me to spot. Um, so, in, so this year we've got, you know, our best, math, best mathematician is going to Trinity Cambridge. He's from Hong Kong. Our best, en, our best physicist engineer is going to Trinity Oxford. He's from Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, our best and only successful PPE candidate, which is the most competitive course at Oxford, he's from Hong Kong. Um, so our, our, our outcomes for those boys, I think, are really good. Um, I think they'll remain um, remain that way. Jennifer, do you think I could could just come in on this one as well? Would oh, you mind? Of course, anytime. Um, I, I just want to support what Tom's saying about what a specialised and fast-moving landscape it is. I mean, at the moment, Oxford is tearing itself apart. I'm a member of three Oxford colleges still. Uh, one of them, um, Oriel College, has refused to take down a statue of uh, Cecil Rhodes. Um, and now some colleges in the university are saying they won't teach students from Oriel. I'm a member of another college, Maudlin, which has decided that it'll take down its portrait of the Queen uh, because, uh, because um, it feels that it, it provides a certain atmosphere in their common room, which they don't want. Now, these are sources of deep, deep division. And what they mean is that Oxbridge admissions is more and more specialist thing. For example, Worcester College now, which is leading the boycott on Oriel, I would not send anyone there now because it is kind of 
well, sorry, it's the truth, but they are in the midst of a revolution and it's not a very comfortable one. So this is becoming much more specialized. And please, I love these universities to stop tearing themselves apart. You, you, you know well what civil discord is, is, is like. And, you know, I've been taken by a very eminent um, figure in Oxford to tour American universities because he believes that that you know, that's the future. And my eyes were open to how good they are. I would never have advised people to go to the US five years ago. Now I'm afraid I would. Um, we're tearing ourselves apart. Wow. So there's, there seems to be division in every country these days. Um, but um, it's interesting that we are seeing a huge trend. And this is echoed by many other independent schools, top independent schools. Their students are really looking towards the US. So within the college, um, I know back in our days, um, Wickhamists didn't need extra help to get into these top universities because the education itself with a diff, um, just, you know, having all these amazing faculty who are themselves researchers and uh, professors, um, teaching them, they already like, you know, rolled into Oxbridge or the top universities worldwide. But nowadays, is that still the case? Um, are there any special programs or mentorship programs that you have put in place? to really help students augment their profile a bit more. And in particular for US, where the, um, the whole philosophy is so different, what they're looking for is also so different. Uh, how do you support Winchester boys um, to apply multi-region? Yeah, I think maybe maybe um, maybe I should be more cynical about this, but I think the one of the things that you're seeing with the widening of UK admissions, particularly at Oxford and Cambridge, is the kind of belated recognition that there's talent all over the place and that, that it's kind of unevenly distributed and that the access to facilities and teaching and resources makes a big makes a big difference and trying to kind of account for that. So I think one of the things, one of the messages that we really try and transmit to the boys is that that previous kind of, did you say roll into university, that you, yeah, you can no longer roll into university, but you've still got that amazing access to facilities, to education, to you know, to to experts in the field. That I think is is really unique. The boys last Tuesday heard from um, Neil Constable, who's the CEO of Shakespeare's Globe. You know, and they, and and if they're applying for English, they can go and see a copy of the the first folio um, in our library. The medics have support from an NHS practicing NHS consultant um, who's been quite busy with COVID over the last year. You know, the boys on Tuesday who want to apply for economics are hearing from a professor at Oxford Said Business School. So I think that that kind of extracurricular richness is is still something and we really are keen on people, you know, the, the type of people I think who come here will want to get the most out of those facilities. Um, and then in terms of the US, I think, well, what's changed? Well, we now have a specialist US advisor. Um, we have much closer links with colleges than we did. Um, I think we also have uh, in terms of you know our brand in the US, uh, I, th I think our brand is more well known than it was you know one or two years ago in the US. So so that they know that the school produces you know on the one hand you have your Trinity mathematicians, but you also have talented generalists who take a number of A levels, div our kind of special subject, and play sports or do music to a high level. That that I think is a really appealing profile for a US college. And what we've seen is you know success at ivy league level but also success at a wider a much wider range of um us destinations so 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 our us boys this year applied to i think 55 54 different colleges we've seen that number be much smaller in previous years where boys you know apply to harvard because they've heard of it so i think their knowledge is growing of the us i think the us's knowledge is growing of us, what we do, what our brand is, who we produce, and, and the level of support they get is just that much higher. You know, there's now a specialized SAT, ACT prep class, a specialized US advisor. They hear from a Harvard um, admissions officer before they go off to interview. They have help with their college essays. So I think that level of support is in there. Um, you know, they, they are still driving the applications. They're still the ones who have to end up going to these places, but but I think that level of support is just that much higher, and I think it's a trend that we'll see more and more of. You know, in in a kind of um, a landscape that maybe has prized specialism for a long time in the in the UK. Actually, the US is quite appealing if you 
have a global mindset, if you want to go to um, places that have a global footprint, and if you want to study courses that are slightly wider than, than the top universities in the UK offer. I, I can see completely why that would be why that would be appealing. Well, that's really interesting insights. Um, so Quail, in particular, you're highlighting the specialist uh, mentality and the generalist mentality. I think that's a great segue into um, a question I have for Mr. Wilkes. In terms of US mentality, they really look for uh, generalists and also people who are able to do many different things beyond academics. So beyond the academic curriculum, uh, what is available at Winchester? And uh, anything new that's being um, in, you know, introduced or implemented that will further broaden students' exposure beyond the academics? Yes, the, 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 that's the kind of our, one of our key offerings, really, is the range of extracurricular activities that we have. So as you, as you probably know, we're, we're building a, a new sports centre, which will in fact be the largest single building project since the school was founded. Uh, so that's a very, very exciting development. And that, that's going that's going very, very well. Um, and, and, it, and it's also indicative of actually how seriously we take sport. Uh, we recently introduced sports uh, scholarships. So we've got a number of boys now who are on sports awards. Uh, and we have uh, boys playing um, all sorts of sports at a very high level, uh, at county level and, and, and even nationally. So um, that, that is hugely exciting. Um, and of course, we all know the not just the physical benefits of sport, but all the pastoral uh, benefits of it and those associated with well-being and so on. But in addition to that, we have an exceptionally strong uh, musical offering uh, with you know, several orchestras, um, lots of chamber ensembles, um, several choirs, um, a world-class chapel choir uh, that makes commercial recordings and, and, and broadcasts and so on. And one of the glories actually has been to able to maintain that during COVID, uh, that provision. Um, but we also have outstanding performances in, in drama. Um, Dr. Hans and I were talking only the other day about a house play um, you know, with potentially quite a small cast, which is one of the best things I've seen anywhere would grace any stage. So drama is vibrant, um, as are all the other traditional things like like, like art. Um, and one of the things that I think is, is tremendous here is our outreach program. So we have a community service program that involves nearly half the boys in the, in the school. And that ranges from all kinds of things like uh, working with dementia patients, um, both feeding them in hospitals, that, you know, that's very, very demanding and challenging. Uh, working with the Blue Apple Theatre Company, which is um, working with, with, with young adults with learning disabilities uh, and getting them to perform on stage, doing remarkable things. One of those uh, acts has actually recently appeared in, in um, uh, Line of Duty, which is a very popular series here. Uh, and he got his training through Blue Apple with, with, with the boys. I mean, it was a wonderful thing to see. Um, and we have a very strong um, combined cadet force as well, uh, who are very outward looking. So um, I think the only thing we don't offer is polo, uh, as far as I can make out, uh, pretty well everything else is here. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a snapshot, Jennifer, of some of the things that we, we, we do. Yes, I, it seems like you have great talent in every single discipline and area. And I still remember um, many years ago when I visited Winchester with my brother there, um, he would say, this is like an under 16 squash champion in, in, in the country. And this person is, you know, literature guru. So my question then is that for a student, let's say from Hong Kong, who used to go to a co-ed school, co-ed day school, and now going to Winchester, a uh, completely different architecture in house systems, uh, as yes. a tight community, but not really family, um, and all boys uh, was you know, surrounded by every single person who has their individual talent. Must be quite an overwhelming um, experience. How do you help students um, settle in? It's a really, <clears throat> that's a really good question. I think, I think the first thing to say is that, of, of course, we have what seven hundred pupils here. But we we break it. We, it's broken down into eleven boarding houses, and <clears throat> so the boarding house really is the family now. For a pupil coming into the school, um, he's in, he's in a boarding house of of sixty four or so pupils. One of the really interesting experiences uh, which the the new boys had when they came here in September this year, as you, as you probably know, is that is that in order to maintain some house bubbles because of COVID. 
Um, all our teaching was in the boarding houses for the first two weeks of time. <laughs> And what, was, what was really interesting uh, about that, there was an unintended benefit for the new boys because they said, actually, it was wonderful. We've got an opportunity to get to know everyone in the house really, really well. And they established themselves within their, within their boarding houses as their kind of new home. So, so I think that's the first thing to say is that they, they have a home here when they, when they arrive. And the way that that's structured is that the housemaster and the matron are the kind of key people for a new people arriving here. And they're also assigned a teje, so that's a boy in the year above them who will show them the ropes, look after them, uh, make sure they know where they've, they've got to be, but we'll also keep an eye on them pastorally. Um, and usually within about the first two or three weeks, they've, they've completely kind of settled into the routine. We're introducing something a bit different this coming year so that new pupils are going to come back a few days early, um, just at the weekend uh, before term starts uh, in full. And they will really be able to do a number of things. I mean, one is that they'll be able to get to, to understand how the campus works. So they'll get, they'll get, they'll get some orientation with that. Um, uh, they will get to know the house really well. Um, and they'll get a chance to have a kind of an induction program, which will cover both academic things, but primarily extracurricular things. So they'll learn how all the sport works. They'll get a chance to play some soccer and, and one or two other things. Um, and they'll have their swimming tests and they'll, they'll go to the music school and just get, get settled in before everything starts off uh, the, following, the following week. Um, we also have a, a, a program called Group, which we haven't been able to do because of COVID this year. We will bring it back in in September. And that, I suppose, is best described as a short course in helping boys to develop emotional intelligence and, and social skills. So one of the things that we look at there is uh, in a small group of about 12 boys with two of the pediatric nurses who were trained in, in group. And uh, the boys learn uh, appropriate ways of sharing emotions and feelings and thoughts. They learn about recognizing the kinds of mindsets that might inhibit them in terms of what they want to try out and what they want to achieve. Because a lot of people come to the school and as you've described, they may feel a bit shy. They may be sort of, they think, gosh, where do I start? And it's like being in a giant sweet shop. Where do I begin? And, and what group does is to help them kind of navigate that process uh, with confidence. Wonders of the school, I think, is the fact that boys are comfortable in their own skin. And we have so many different types of boy here. And the houses are chosen on the basis of, you know, making sure that there's a really wide spread of all sorts of different characters throughout the school. So we don't have a house which is, you know, specializes in music or one that specializes in art or football. It's, it's very much that actually the houses each want a widespread of ability and, and, and interest and variety. Um, so it's making sure that when they arrive, they feel really confident about seeing what's available to them. Now, if a boy's feeling, you know, out, out of sorts, um, there are lots of people that he can talk to. And the pastoral care here is, is, is second to none, I think. Um, so I hope that's, that's helped a little bit with how we go about boys settling in. That seems extremely thoughtful, much thoughtful than decades ago when boys are just dumped into like cold showers. Yeah. Um, and I, I particularly like how you mentioned the EQ training, um, getting boys to talk about the emotion. That will prepare yeah. them very well, not just for life, but also for the girls who are joining at sixth form. <laughs> yes, I, I, absolutely. Yes, yes. Yeah. That will be very important. <laughs> so, a bit of a sensitive question here. How do you deal with two things which parents in Hong Kong sometimes ask about? One is bullying. And two is uh, responsible use of e electronic devices, you know, gaming, right. you know, Facebook. How, how, how do you deal with um, students who might cross the boundary on these two aspects? Yes. OK, well, that's a that's a really that's a really good question. Um, with, with regard to, to, to bullying, I think you have to be very clear about what the distinctions are between bullying and unkind or thoughtless behavior. So the vast majority of things when, when things go wrong socially are, are the result of thoughtlessness or, or insensitivity. Um, and, and those are usually put right very quickly. But it is very important that we pick up on those things immediately as soon as they happen so that they don't become a habit. Because what happens with bullying is that that's when things are repeated, when they're targeted and where somebody feels that, 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 that they've been singled out. And we are very, very clear with the whole kind of Teje system and with the tutor group system that everyone looks out for everybody else. And one of the, one of the wonderful surprises, I think, which uh, new boys have when they come to the school, they say, God, the top years are so nice. <laughs> the older boys are so nice. They, they really look after us. 
Um, you know, in the days of Tom Brown's school days, you know, the 19th century Victorian public school where there was kind of fagging and, you know, it was all about older boys having privileges. That has long gone. Sorry, I, you... We could make our seniors beds. Yeah, and, and that is absolutely... There's no place for that at all. Everyone contributes to the life of the house, and it's very important that everyone's prepared to do certain kinds of tasks and so on, but it has nothing to do with age or, 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 or seniority or anything of that, of that kind. So there is a culture where that, those attitudes are not, are not tolerated. But more importantly, it's a culture where a completely different way of looking at relationships, which is that of, of mutual support and fostering talent, it's the encouragement of that. It's, you know, it's, it's no good saying in a school, we don't tolerate bullying, there's no, there's no place for it. That isn't enough. What you have to say is actually what we are encouraging are these sorts of relationships. Now, if, if a boy is persistent, um, then he has a very serious discussion with me. And boys are usually very, very quick to recognize, actually, when they take a step back from their behavior, they can see, yes, actually, that was really inappropriate to say that, and I'm sorry, and so on. And, and we find that, that, that most instances where uh, boys have been unhappy because of the behavior of another pupil um, are always best dealt with by complete openness um, and, and sitting down and saying, look, this is what, this is, what is going on. Um, do you recognize the impact of this behavior on this, on this other person? Um, so, so frankness is everything, but there has to be, it has to have a, uh, has to have steel as well. So, you know, um, yes, if a boy, if a boy were, were to persist, um, and to continue to persist, his place in school would be in jeopardy because we can't, we, you know, we can't tolerate it, but it's very, very rare and we deal with it very robustly. Um, but as I say, the vast majority of these things are, are thoughtlessness and, and Im immaturity, uh, and it's a useful educational experience. Yeah. What about gaming and electronic devices? Yeah, so um, we're, we're, we're pretty pretty strict about taking in mobile phones at, at night time um, because we don't want boys doing anything on their mobile phones at night. So they have to hand they have to hand them in certainly in the in the young age. And this, of course, is the school about being social, not about social media. So boys are not allowed to use their phones in public at all during the week. Uh, except after chapel on Sundays when we relax that rule just a little bit. But they're not, you know, phones are not supposed to be visible at all. Um, and uh, generally they aren't. Occasionally a boy will sneak one out when, I think, when he thinks I'm not looking, <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a word, but they, but they know that. And also they're not supposed to wander around with you know, headphones in their, in their ears because, because they're supposed to be interacting with, with, with each other. All children need a lot of education about social media, as you, as you know. <clears throat> so we are pretty we're pretty vigilant about that that if we feel a boy is spending too much time on social media in his spare time we we say look i think you could do without your phone for a, for a while let's get you out playing some soccer or, or cricket or whatever it happens to be um, we have it's the most wonderful environment here the playing fields are beautiful we're on the edge of a national park and we encourage the boys to get out and make the most of it of the environment they have i guess the environment is distracting enough for them to go and explore as opposed to looking at the phone. So thank you so much, um, Mr. Wilt. Uh, and that shall lead me to um, Mr. Shannon, Andy, uh, for the billion dollar question, uh, which is about admissions, right? <laughs> but before we talk about admissions, there's a lot of parents, to be honest, um, they've heard about Winchester, especially now with all the modernizing initiatives and all these um, all-rounded education um, that you're furthering. Um, even, you know, uh, helping students apply for U.S. colleges and so much thoughtful pastoral care being integrated into um, the school. Uh, I'm sure parents uh, will even want to, um, you know, apply to Winchester um, regardless of research that they have done or not, right? So some parents will just apply and not even having seen the website just based on the reputation. So the question is, where is Winchester and what is the city like? <laughs> especially now with COVID, people can't travel. Can you just give us a bit of a luck guide uh, about Winchester? Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, absolutely, and uh, uh, what a good way to start. Um, where is Winchester? Well, Winchester is in, in the south of England, um, the ancient capital of, uh, ancient Anglo-Saxon capital of the country. Um, in terms of placing it for the families in Hong Kong, we are an hour away from London and we are 50 minutes away from Heathrow. So very, very close indeed. But we are also unique for many, for many senior schools in that we are both urban and we are rural. Mr. Wilkes has talked just briefly there, setting the scene for the fact we have a national park on our doorstep. Um, but we also live in the most beautiful um, city 
and it's vibrant, it's culturally active. We had the most beautiful buildings around us. So the boys can wander into town, developing that, that sense of independence, going with their friends into town, and they can then come back in on their bike and go for a walk in the countryside, or go fishing, or, or go canoeing, or walking, whatever it is they want to do. So we had this lovely mix of urban and rural, which is, I think, pretty unique amongst the senior schools, which are either urban, all rural, but not both. Uh, and that is what Winchester most definitely is. It is a stunningly beautiful city. Um, and the school itself is, I admit to being slightly biased, uh, I think the most beautiful school um, in, in, in the UK. Yes. Um, over 85 listed buildings. Um, so if you were uh, of interest in architecturally um, or from an artistic point of view, you would be stunned by the presence of the school. It's beautiful, yes. peaceful. But and a really lovely place to grow up for five years. So Andy, um, a lot of parents ask, you know, what, what does Winchester look for? How should I prepare my students for Winchester? To be honest, objectively speaking, I cannot answer that question because I have met parents who have, you know, tutored the kids since the age of two for a school like Winchester and don't get in. And I also know, know a student who actually was kicked out of school in Hong Kong, but was picked up by Winchester and is actually a genius and is now flourishing at the school, right? Um, so what do you look for? There's a very special eye for potential Wickhamists that is done well by admissions team. So what, what do you look for? Okay, thank you. Um, what do we look for? Well, I think first of all, I say we're a school that looks at the person and not a school. Okay, that, that's the first thing. So does it, are we a school that judges you on a, how you acted on a particular day at a particular time and what score you got in a test? No, we're not. Those things matter, but what we're interested in is the person, the boy himself. Um, and that is why we interview every single boy for over 45 minutes uh, who comes to the school. What are we looking for in that interview? Well, what we're looking for, it, I suppose, really are five things. First of all, a natural, what I call a natural intelligence. Um, someone who enjoys being in a classroom, who enjoys discovery, and then wants to go and talk about it with both his teachers or indeed his friends through the boarding house and everywhere else. Second, we're looking for boys who are happy in themselves, Jennifer. You've mentioned it already, um, but boys who are not trying to be anybody that they're not. Boys who are just very happy with being who they naturally are. Um, Hi, sir. Nice to meet you. I'm me. In whatever form that takes. Smile, glint in the eye. And that's art, that's music, that's design technology, that's sport, it's drama. It's all those things that whatever it is, what we're not looking for and what does not come to Winchester is arrogance, selfishness, people who put themselves first. The founder of this school was very much about giving back was very much about service. And that is what we want the boys to do as they go through the school, is to be confident about who they are and develop those skills and then start to give back both within the school, but importantly to the community. And that's what the second master, Mr. Wilkes, has talked about already. Okay. Um, thirdly, we want them, and this has probably already started for many of the families, we want them to be curious. We want them to ask questions um, and, and, and to develop a, a curiosity for how things work. Now, yesterday, sir, you said this. Today, you're saying that. Yes, please. We, we like those questions. Um, and like being challenged. Passion, Jennifer, matters. Yeah. Um, and, and lastly, I suppose, well, no, two more things. We, we want them to be busy. Mm -hmm. The happiest boys I know here are the busiest boys mm -hmm. because they're connecting across lots of different areas with lots of different people. Um, and so being busy matters and one of the challenges for Hong Kong parents is how they do that. And, and having lived in the city for three years, it's one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I didn't propose to my wife in Hong Kong. Um, but I did live there for three years. Um, it is, it is, I know what a fantastic city it is, how vibrant it is, but equally I know the challenges. And part of those challenges is to develop the extracurricular side of, of a boy's uh, offering as he goes through from years six, seven, and eight in Hong Kong to nine and in, the, in a senior school such as Winchester. And lastly, and very importantly, what do we look for? Kindness. Mm. Uh, this is a full boarding school. 
it matters um, that boys are kind to each other. It matters um, both within the staff and within the community. All the teachers live here and we mingle together with the boys seven days a week. It truly is a community in the way that many Hong Kong families would recognize and Chinese families would, would recognize. Um, and so kindness matters, how we look after each other, how we treat each other, how we talk to each other in the same ways that Dr. Uh, Mr. Brooks was, uh, uh, was saying as well. So, so those are the things we look for at interview. Um, I hope that gives you- Andy, that, that complements um, the motto of the school, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Man, important. Uh, whenever I see Wickhamers or, or boys who get into Winchester, I always think of raw talents. Like it's just something that's very kind of um, uh, organic and something that's not molded. Like, you know, parents can't say you have to be, you have to love piano. It has to be something that's kind of really from them. And um, busy is great as if, if, it's some, if it's driven by intrinsic motivation. So and, yeah. and 45 minutes of interview, you will definitely see that coming through. That's exactly the point. And you can. You can see the engagement. And this is an interview which, when it takes place uh, at 11 years old, so when the boys are in year six, is not about what is right or wrong at an interview. It's about the potential that we can see and trying to see from the boys. And I think one of the, the, sort of the, the things I would encourage mums and dads to do uh, ahead of any part of the winter selection is to talk to their boys, to develop a sense of what how they think to develop the fact you know do they have an opinion and if they think something why do they think that um, boys are not very good at saying that particularly at 11 years old so save a fortune on tutoring don't do that talk to your children instead and ask them about what's happening in the world what matters to them and listen to them and ask them why because that's exactly the environment they're going to come to when they come to Winchester with boys from around the world not just from the UK but from around the world who are going to ask them exactly the same question every day boys at Winchester ask what and why so top tip that is the thing to get to, to talk to their parents the socratic thinking um that drives interest to learn that's great thank you so much andy the last last question then goes back to dr han if you were to give an advice a piece of advice to students or parents uh, what would that be i think i'm going to go back on um on what mr shedden said we're interested in a person develop your child don't force feed them. Allow them to further their interests by support. Make sure that they grow up confident, grow up with a sense of responsibility to others, and grow up with a respect for education. In my experience, Hong Kong families are absolutely outstanding in that regard. You have a wonderful education system where you are, and we always like to welcome students from Hong Kong. You sharpen up our act. For example, um, I've learned from this call that I'm going to make Mr. Wilkes start a polo club. <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think <laughs> also, yeah, yeah, I think, I think also, I'm going to just check that Mr. Shedden can really count to five, because I think we got up to seven there. But you see, that's the way that we trust to personalities and individuality rather than simply trusting to the obvious coached answer. Yeah. And yeah. finally, I don't think Mr. Quayle has put a foot wrong, which is a great disappointment to me. Uh, but I have to say that the, the, the bland background that he has chosen would not allow one to know that he was an iron man. He could wow. run up, he could run up the peak. He could swim to Kowloon. Um, I dread to think what he could do if he was let loose on me in a dark alley at night. Uh, so I make sure I don't meet him in that way. But I think we, we, we really value our links with Hong Kong. We really value the way that you value education and your children. And we look forward to those links continuing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hans and Mr. Wilkes and uh, Mr. Quayle and also Mr. Shedden for all your insightful sharing today. Um, it's always uh, the best for parents to hear directly from yourselves um, than uh, indirectly through us. Um, and I, I'm sure they have taken a lot of uh, great insights away today.